This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the Word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead. And that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. How many think that God is up to something? If I could give uh, this message a title, I would call it 2020 and the Kingdom Warrior. If you have your Bibles today, I want to go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 6. <clears throat> you see, one of the reasons that I think this needs to be taught is it seems especially within Western culture that everything to suppress masculinity has been put into place within our culture. We can just simply look at the well, the witch's brew of what we call the environment and what we eat and what we drink are so heavily laden with protoestrogens. And to be truthful in this day and age, to be a male is almost taboo. I remember years ago I had a friend, he was functioning as the dean of Biblical Life College and Seminary, and he was going through clinical pastoral education. And so in the whole thing, they were... Uh, demanding that he get in touch with his feminine self. And uh, he prayed about it and prayed about it and prayed about it and, and he had to write a paper on it. So his paper was quite short, said, if there is a feminine side of me, she's a lesbian and she's entirely in love with my wife because I don't have any other kind of feminine side. God's called me to be a man. But society has tried to put men in a box because historically, whenever men have had enough and they rise up, tyranny fears. Hell fears. Now, I'm not, I don't want to say a thing about women warriors. I'm not, I'm not trying to put them down in any way. But how many know that a, a woman warrior can only be as functional as the man that is her head? And he has to be one step ahead, one tier ahead. That's one of the reasons I always feel like I have a need to run being married to Mary. Anybody knows her knows that she is a warrior. She is like a banny hen that knows kung fu, okay? And she gets mad at the devil. God in, in 2020 is going to begin releasing the men of whatever chemical, psychological, sociological, environmental, cultural bounds the enemy has put us on. And we're going to see true warriors begin to raise up all across the body of Christ. And I want to start here in verse 1. I'm going to read out of the Amplified Bible. Now we need to understand when you read 2 Timothy, this is the last epistle the Apostle Paul ever wrote. In fact, church history teaches us that the day that he finished this, the next day, he ran to his executioners. Because he told Timothy, I had finished the fight, to finish the race, I have fought the fight. In other words, there isn't a thing left on my to-do list and I'm ready to go home. 
But he was also extremely cognizant of the fact that men like Timothy and Titus that he had mentored, the next day they were going to lose their mentor. That they had to step into leadership roles knowing there wasn't the Apostle Paul to fall back on. And so you can kind of sense that, when you really put it into context, you can sense that in the words of Second Timothy, like when he tells him to preach the word in season and out. And he gives this charge to him. It's because he knew that those words would echo in Timothy's life as long as he was on the earth. And I wonder how many times in the midnight hour when Timothy was struggling and you had Rome after you and you had the occult after you and you had Judaism after you, I wonder how many times he didn't open that letter and read 2 Timothy for encouragement from his mentor, setting it in context. So you, my son, be strong, strengthened inwardly, and in the grace, spiritual blessing that is to be found only in Jesus Christ. And the instructions which you have heard from me, along with many witnesses, transmitted and trust as a deposit to reliable and faithful men who will be competent and qualified to teach others also. Take with me your share of the hardships and suffering which you are called to endure as a good first-class soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier who is in service gets entangled in the enterprises of civilian life. His aim is to satisfy and please the one who enlisted him. And if anyone enters competitive games, he is not crowned unless he competes lawfully, fairly, according to the rules laid down. It is the hard work of the farmer who labors to produce, who must be the first partaker of his fruit. And what I want to center in on is he used the thing of be a good soldier. Now, when you read this, you also have to set it in historical context. They were living in the Roman Empire. Interesting thing about the Roman Empire, every soldier was a first-tier operator. They were the most lethal force ever assembled at that time on planet Earth. And so with that in mind, he's pointing to you saying being a good soldier, when that guy's out on the battlefield, he's not worried about the the donut shop that he owns back in Rome. All he is concerned about is executing the orders of his commander-in-chief. You know, when you're a soldier and you're in battle, life isn't easy. I remember we would, we would call it bivouacs or exercises, and sometimes in the military, the summer ones I didn't mind too much, okay? You're going out there, the birds are singing, it's nice and warm out. It's those ones where they got me up in the mountains of Germany, there was three to four foot of snow, you had to build, a, you had to build a, a, basically something to shield your diesel that you had for your heater because it was so cold when the wind would bring up underneath it, it would gel the diesel, and you would get cold. And I remember taking me out. <laughs> but you know what? You don't ask the general, why would you take me out in the snow? Why would you take me out? And we're in the middle of a, of, a, of a hurricane. Why did you take me out in the middle of this? As a soldier, you have a job to do. And whatever the situation is, it's your duty to figure out a way of overcoming it to get the task done. That's the situation that he was trying to paint before Timothy. No matter what the enemy throws at you, you as a good soldier, you have been equipped to overcome. You know, one of my, there's a few shows I like on TV. One of them is SEAL Team. Because what they do is they problem solve on the fly in the field. And if one of them ever stops, what are you doing? I'm figuring out a way around. I'm figuring out a way through. I'm figuring, I'm, I'm, I'm working the problem. And I, sometimes that'll just preach. 
You don't sit down and cry because you had a hard time. You figure out a way. You muster up more strength. You see, in reality, no one understands the Roman soldier today like our first tier operators in the U.S. military, the Deltas, the Navy SEALs. I don't know what they call them. I think they used to call them Red Rangers or something like that in the, in the, in the Marine Corps. I'm not Marine, so I don't know. I'm Army. But they, they knew they would problem solve. They would work the problem. How many times have we wanted to sit down instead of getting in the Word and hitting our knees and find the way around the problem? But in this life, we've got to realize as long as you're on planet earth, you are in the theater of war. You know, it's interesting when we had our guys in Vietnam, there was no rest and relaxation places in country. They would take them out of the theater of war because only when you were out of the theater of war could you ever relax. I want you to think about that for a minute. One of the, when I read the book of Job, one of the things that uh, just jumped out at me one day, he was looking at the calamity that happened. Now we know it ended up with a kind of a bet between God and the devil. But you know that he came out victorious on the other side with only one promise of God. One promise. I'll protect your life. The devil can't kill you. When was the last time you grabbed your Bible? How many promises are in there? Job lived before Abraham. He wasn't even under the Abrahamic covenant. He predates him. Just one little promise that he was able to hold on to. And when he got to the other side, he got restored twice as much. I tell you what, our promises from God is our go-to manual on how to work the problem. How well do you know the promises? Because every promise has a task that causes the promise to activate. And so when you work the problem with the Word, the Word goes to work on the problem. And that's one of the reasons why the enemy wants men to sit down and not have a place. I'm going to deviate off my notes. In your household, who is, the, who is the highest spiritual authority in your household? Now, in today's church in the Western world, they say the pastor is. That is wrong. It's the man of the household. It's the pastor's job to coach the men so that they can... Take it home and use it. But what we have done is we have emasculated the male by the way that we view church. And they think that all the service of God is done right here. No. This is like me being a coach and I've got the football team in. And I'm, giving, I'm teaching them the plays. They're the ones who go out and play the game. When church is done correctly, it empowers the men, it empowers the women to engage life and make a difference for Christ. But we've been too Greco-Roman. This is not theater. Although it's gotten worse with the emergent church, not only do you have flashing lights, you can literally turn on the glory of God with a switch and a fog machine comes on. I remember years ago, Mary Ann Brown, when she was alive, she came, and in our conversation, you have to know Mary Ann Brown, she was so prophetic, and she was so well known that some of the largest mega churches in America at that time had invited her, she was on the board of some, and because she was so biblical, she got disinvited from some boards. And so she's telling me this, and I can just see her just shaking her head in disbelief. I, you, you can feel it over the phone. She said they turned the fog machine on in this one church, and they literally called it the glory of God. Kind of makes you wonder what they put in the coffee out in the foyer before church. 
How many know the, the glory of God can only be created by the presence of God? It's not made by frigid air. It's time for us to get out of theater. This is, this is training. Sometimes I, I think, and I, I love to go to some of the conferences I go with and just watch Coach Dave. I tell you what. You know, you, you don't sit there before the game saying, guys, I don't think we have a chance. Just go out there and get your participation trophy. It'll be okay. What is he doing? He's going over the plays and he's revving them up just as much as he can so that when they go out, man, they're loaded for bear. That's what church is supposed to be. It's not about feeling good. It's about feeling empowered when you leave. Okay. So I want to deal with this is, if this is a, an arena... And guys, we got some fighting to do. We've been asleep at the wheel and there's been a lot going on in our culture and in America that has been done because number one, we did not hold politicians accountable. We did not hold educators accountable. Do you know how you hold educators accountable? You quit going to their schools. You say, if you don't quit teaching that junk, you're never gonna get another penny tuition. You know, if enough people do that, they'll get, the, they'll get the hint. You send a kid into college and the university as a Christian, they come out as a communist. Something's wrong. You send them to Bible college, they walk in there with the fire of God, and they leave almost becoming an agnostic. Something is wrong. We got to fight. In this hour, God is releasing an anointing for the warrior upon the remnant. It is anointing to fight, and guys, we got some fighting to do. Now I want to deal with the rules of engagement. I want to go to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. I've been doing some research about principalities and powers or rulers of darkness, digging through the lexicons for the book I'm working on, and I found out something about principalities I didn't know. That's why, you know, sometimes I feel like, I, I feel like a, a guy that gets his back hoe out because it's time to dig deep, you know what I mean? And I, sometimes I can get lost in the lexicons. Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That word might in the Greek means the power or the ability to do anything. Be strong in the Lord. You can't do it in your flesh. You cannot take testosterone supplements and take on the devil. You need spiritual testosterone, not physical. Although in this day and age, the other may help as well, since we're depleted. Okay. Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and the power is might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness, of the, and, and rulers of darkness of this age, and spiritual hosts or spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Now, when I will, first of all, I'm going to look at that word wrestle. How many know it wasn't going down and having a cup of coffee? Wasn't going down and sitting down and having a beer like we've had some presidents want to do. And let's talk out our differences. This word in the Greek is pale. It means to wrestle a contest between two in which each endeavors to throw the other, which is decided when the victor is able to hold his opponent down with his hand upon his neck. Okay. Now, I didn't want to stop there. When you look at the, the in, in the Greek, you have now you have verbs, you have nouns, uh, but you also have, you have tenses that kind of share what was in the heart. Why, they, why did the Apostle Paul use pale? First of all, it's a verb, it's an action, it's something you do. It's not something that you watch, it's something that you do, okay? Secondly, it's present. The verb tense where the writer portrays an action in process or in a state which no assessment of the, uh, of the action's completion. In other words, it's present tense. It's still going on. No one 
has tapped out. Okay? As long as we are in the first heaven, the wrestling is going on all the time. Secondly, it's active. The grammatical voice that signifies that the subject is performing the verb or the action or the state described in the verb, and it's indicative. The mood in which the action of the verb or state of being is described is portrayed by the writer as real. It's not figurative. He wasn't trying to just paint a picture. In Ephesus, they knew about the principality over that area. Because a few years prior when the Apostle Paul was there, he'd only been there less than two months, and they almost all got killed by the stirring up that that principality had done within that culture. So it's an action, it's present, it's real. And one of the reasons that we are in the state we are in America is the church has forgot it's still going on and it's real. We sat down in the good times when the Judeo-Christian ethic, the Protestant ethic, was the ethic of the nation. And we sat down and just twiddled our thumbs as they begin to strip it away and then pass abortion. Well, Mike, that was the Supreme Court. What can you do? We had a president during this, right before the Civil War that when they said it was legal to keep slaves and that the black man was not considered human, basically, the president put them under house arrest and said, we are not going to accept that ruling because it's unjust. And did you know that was very constitutional? That we as the American people can tell the Supreme Court, you were wrong. It's called an opinion. It's not law. It's not law until our legislators that we pass and that we can also kick out of office. They have got to pass it into a law. The president has to sign off on it. And yet prior to case law in America, the jury had the ability to say, I don't care if that's what they consider constitutional, the way that they've interpreted the law is an unjust application, and the jury could overturn even the Supreme Court. Boy, that isn't things they teach you in civics class anymore, is it? Where was the outrage? We surrendered. Just as long as the money keeps coming in, there's a chicken in every pot. But how many know they kept inching us closer and closer to economic slavery? Did you know in our generation, both the husband and wife have to work to have the same spending power of a man back in the 50s? That wasn't by accident, it was so they could tear apart the home. And we just sat down. They took prayer out of school, and we just sat down. So now people are bringing weapons into our schools. And they have to have metal detectors and drills. You know, prior to them taking prayer out of school, all they had to worry about is people making out in the hallways, bubble gum, and a, and a skirmish, a fight every once in a while. And maybe too many guys with too much brill cream in their hair. <laughs> that was it! You took prayer out of school because you wanted to remove the Protestant ethic from this nation and behold the results. And we just sat here. Where was the warriors? I found out this morning what Coach Dave is doing. He is in the process of getting a group together to sue the NFL for having porn during halftime at the Super Bowl this year. Go get them, Coach. Monday, I'm writing a check to support what he's doing. Unseemly, pagan, and they call it entertainment. 
Guys, wrestling of believers with these higher entities is ever present and real. Never forget as long as you're living in the first heaven, we're on the battlefield. Now something interesting, drilling down on what principalities means, and I ran across this. Now first of all, when we look at the Strong's Enhanced Lexicon, it means the beginning, the origin, the first person, or thing of the series. So in other words, they're the most ancient ones. Of all of God's created angels, they're the most ancient ones, many believe, of the highest order. Why is that important? Because Lucifer was a chief principality. You see, archangel is a theological term that we made up. You can't find archangel anywhere in the Bible unless you have a new translation that translates it that way. And Daniel, the one that Michael, Michael that came, was a chief prince that corresponds with principality. In the Greek, he was a chief principality. Not all the principalities fell. Just certain ones of them with Lucifer. So Lucifer was a chief principality. And some of the boys came with him as he started the first mafia of the universe. But when I began looking at this, and I found this in the Greek-English dictionary of the New Testament based on Semitic domains... Longer than mayonnaise, the title. But listen to this. A principality is a supernatural power having some particular role in controlling the destiny and activity of human beings. Now we can take that all the way back to the Tower of Babel. When we read in Deuteronomy where Moses was recounting the Tower of Babel, God divorced humanity, and the most accurate translation we have now because of the Dead Sea Scrolls that settles the controversy, the King James says that God divided uh, the nations according to the number of the sons of Israel. Israel didn't even exist. And how many sons of Israel are there today? Was, Was he speaking prophetically? The Dead Sea Scrolls, gave clarity and settled an argument. It's literally translated according to the B'nai Elohim, the fallen principalities and powers and rulers that had aligned themselves with Nimrod at the Tower of Babel, that when they rebelled against God, God divorced humanity. And then he said a promise, but Jacob is going to be my heritage. Why use Jacob? Because he was the conniver that became a prince with God. He was the surplanter that was transformed when he he wrestled with God all night. And in the morning, God touched the hollow of his thigh, which meant he walked differently the rest of his life. And he says, I'm going to take one man out of Babylon. His name was Abraham, and I'm going to have me a nation. Now, from Abraham to the cross, only one nation was not under a principality or power, ruler, or darkness. They were directly under God, and that was Israel. When you and I got saved, we got grafted in. Now, think about this for a minute. To get grafted in, you first have to be broken off. You weren't just sitting there floating in the vacuum, were you? There is a principality over America. It is a Baal installed by the Freemasons. When you got saved, the Holy Ghost snapped you off of their tree, that wild olive branch, and grafted you into Messiah. I am no longer under the control of that principality or power. It no longer has a right to control my destiny. How many know that thing doesn't like that? That higher entity does not like that. And so part of its wrestling is to bring you back under control so that it once again can control your destiny and not Christ. So we are constantly wrestling with these entities so that they do not regain control of our life. Now here are some mechanisms or instruments of control. Relational torment, tur- turmoil, and conflict. Taking the house out of harmony. It opens the door to that principality. Sickness and disease, economic distress, culture, cultural and political pressure are just a few. 
How many know the Apostle Paul found the whole concept of cultural pressure when the men in Ephesus rose up to, stone, to kill them all? Whether it was stoning or by sword, it doesn't matter. Can you imagine <coughs> causing such a ruckus that for two hours the men of the city cried out, Great is Diana. It was one of the birthplaces of female deity worship that had been established for 1,000 years before Paul got there. In other words, he woke up Big Mama Bear and she was not happy. And so he tells them years later, you're very aware that you're constantly wrestling. It isn't the butcher, it isn't the baker, it's not the idol maker. That's your problem. You can win those to Christ. It's the principality that controls that culture. And we have allowed the principality over America to control and they have suppressed the gospel. You know, at least one of the things the, the president is doing, I, I, I saw where he is skipping the climate, uh, climate uh, control thing, climate change conference. You know what he's holding? He's holding a symposium on religious freedom in America in D.C. at the same time. For all of, of his warts, and how many know he has them just like the rest of us? And he's not a savior. I don't think he's a Cyrus, but I tell you what he is. He is a bull in a china closet. And I say, go, bull, go. Tear down the deep state. Tear the whole thing down. Because it's causing all of them to show what they really are. The facades are coming down. He has them so freaked out. They, they, well, one moment they say, we want to make sure everything's done constitutional. I'm thinking, since when? You have never done it in the whole process that you just did. None of it was constitutional. Showing America what's really going on. Because he realizes if the church does not have the freedom to thrive, America is over. And guys, there are more mechanisms, instruments of control. We cannot allow these things to pull us back under the control of a principality. We must wrestle out of their attempted control and push our way back into a kingdom position. Okay? Two, faith is the power of the kingdom to overcome. I want to go to 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. How many know without faith, it's impossible to please God? And without holiness, it's impossible to see Him. So my task in my life is to be that when I get to see Him, He's got a smile on His face. I want holiness, and I want faith. Shouldn't that be the goal of every believer? Without holiness, it's impossible to see God. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Starting in verse 1, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God and everyone who loves him who begot also love him who, are, who is begotten of him. By this we know we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Now I want you to underline the next, the next thing in your Bible because this is echoed all the way in the Torah, all the way through the word of God. And one of the very last books written in the New Testament, it's still the same. For this is the love of God that we should keep his commandments. It started in the beginning of the book. And although we put Revelation in the back of the book, chronologically, it's not in the back of the book. You have to have Revelation, and then you've got to have 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. 3rd John should literally be the back of the book. But they thought since it ended with the great crescendo and everything made new, we'll go ahead and put it at the back. I remember I heard preachers, I was at one conference and this preacher said, you know, we don't need any more revelation today. God, there's no such thing as prophets today. There's no such thing as prophetic words today. Because when John the Revelator finished the book of Revelation and set down his pen, there was not another thing spoken And there was a college professor kind of saying, uh, 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 what about the three things John wrote after that? 
Uh-oh, boy, preacher's really good. It's just not based on fact. For whoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Now, I want you to write this down. And I heard Lester Summerall say it last night in, a, in a, an old film that we watched of him. Faith is not a force. If you make it into a force, it's like working magic. And a lot of the faith movement has done that. Which means, well, if you know how to work the mojo, you can get blessed to God, but then you over here can't because you don't know what I know. Well, here's what I know. It's a way of life. Another word for faith is trust. How do you develop trust? You get to know somebody. You walk the road with them. One thing I can trust about Mary, if there's a kid around, it's going to get loved on. If she has a half of a chance, she will fix it something to eat and find out what that child likes to make sure that she can fix it something to eat. And I don't care if she's so tired that she can't hardly get up out of the chair, that child is never going to know it. Ever. I can see her on one of the few things that would take her off her deathbed when it's time for her to go is the kid shows up that needs loving and hunger and she would love on that kid and feed that kid and said, okay, I can go on now. Well, Mike, how can you say that? I have walked with her for 37 years. I know her. I can trust her character that that is always going to be something that she does. Hell can't change it. Heaven endorses it. She'll whoop the person who gripes about it. She'll say, you leave these babies alone and leave me loving on these babies alone. Walking with God. Not this religiosity that we have in America where we just meet once a week and we, we go through the things and we can now, now we, if we, because we're ADHD, we have to have a five minute sermonette and you have to have a light show and fog machines and to keep you awake, they have a Starbucks out in the foyer to make sure you're well caffeinated to stay there the whole 20 to 30 minutes that you have a service. To placate your consciousness and provide no transformation. I was on an interview this week with Upfront and the Prophetic. And here's, here's the prophet and the prophetess. And I mean, they've been in the prophetic movement forever. And they're saying, enough with the lights, enough with the fog machines, and enough with the skinny jeans. And I started chuckling. I'm thinking, those skinny jeans, I just need to make it as a skirt because it will fit on one leg. <laughs> okay? I am well past skinny jeans. Quit trying to be hip and start trying to be holy. That a lot of the church is waking up and it's had enough of this stuff. In fact, the entire origin of the mega church, we can even take it past Wheaton College where they brought new age gurus in to teach ministers how to build mega churches. There was a church that was struggling. And it, so it did a canvas of the entire area as far as they would know. They'd go four or five miles outside the radius of the church. Said, well, what's the number one thing you want of a, from a church? Truth, the gospel, maybe? I want to feel better about myself. Well, you know, if you get saved, start acting like Jesus, you'll feel really a whole lot better about yourself. So they began orchestrating everything of the church to just simply give you a big warm fuzzy and make you feel better. Do you know you can feel better all the way straight into hell and not even mind the flames until they consume you? Sometimes you've got to get uncomfortable to get out of the trap you're in. How many know hell's a big trap? Sin and sin exposed is supposed to make you very uneasy. Why? Because then you start crying out for a Savior. Come on. I don't know how I got off on that. 
But the way that we have done church is we have removed the lifestyle. There's a phrase in Genesis where it said that Abraham walked with God. And the, the walk, the halakha, it was hit halakha, the walk with God. But between Abraham and God was the alaf tav, the et, the connective word. Jesus was in the middle of that relationship to connect Abraham to God. When I come into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, my walk changes because I am now walking with God. And that's the call, to walk out of Babylon and let God walk with you into something that you have never witnessed before in your life. Freedom. Wholeness, the promise. And as you do that, you develop faith if you tend to it. But we, we take our relationship with God like a lot of marriages end up, and that's why there's so, so much divorce. Mary and I, we were talking the other day, this is how grateful we're. We see, we're getting closer. We see people our age getting div a divorce. Oh, dear Lord, I could not even think about having to date again. I am so far beyond the dating scene. And, and you, you see these guys, 60, trying to act like a 25-year-old constantly hurting themselves. Because they're, they're trying to, you know, they're, they're going for the youngins, they're going for the 50-year-olds, you know. And look at me, I can lift this weight. Where's the big guy? You know. Don't want to go through that. What's wonderful is Mary knows all my warts, I know all her warts, and us rubbing together have rubbed off some of the warts. And that in the relationship, we've learned to lean into one another. You see, in our relationship with God, in the tough times, I lean into Him. You know, the Jesus that we're walking with right now, the only way, you cannot see Him in the Gospels. Big question mark. You've got to go to the book of Revelation. We're walking right now with the Jesus that John ate carpet the second he saw him, whose voice was as many waters, whose eyes were a flame of fire. The glory of God, his hair was white as snow, and his feet were burnt like brass because he had come through tribulation and had overcome. That's the one that we're walking with. And let me tell you something. When I'm walking with him, those feet as if they were of brass will never lead me where he cannot sustain me. That needs to sink in. You see, that's, that's what, what trust is. I marveled at Lester Sumrall when he spoke of, you know, God called him to be a missionary and to go overseas. And so he's getting ready to get on the boat to go to Australia. Paid his ticket. He has $12 to his name. In fact, before he left, he ended up ministering at one of the largest Pentecostal churches in America before he left. And he said, it's funny. Every, time, every night they took up an offering but never mentioned my name. And one of the reasons was they didn't give him anything when he left. He got on a boat to go around the world with $12 in his pocket. He gets to Australia, and simply because of the way he carried himself, everybody thought he was wealthy, so he spent a week preaching at this church, and guess how much they gave him? Exactly the same as the one in Los Angeles. And so he's in his room, and he tells God, I've got to get on a train to go where I'm getting ready to go. You called me to be here. Either you provide the ticket, or I'm never leaving this room, and I'll die in this room if I don't get a ticket. That's how long I'm going to stay in this room. The next morning, a man showed up and said, I know you're wealthy. He'd already spent his $12. I don't think he had two nickels to rub together. But see, he carried himself as a citizen of the kingdom. 
He said, but my wife and I were afraid you didn't know the system here in Australia that not only you have to buy two tickets, not only a ticket for the train, but you've got to buy a second ticket because you've got to reserve your spot. And since we were afraid you didn't know, we bought you both tickets. You see, that's faith. Why did he do that? How could he do that? Because he heard God in the little things and was obedient in the little things because it takes experience, knowledge, combined, equal trust. That's why this is something that we got to walk out. We got to walk out ourselves. I can't walk it out for you. I can give you what I know and, and I'll say, go, go, go. I'll wave the flag for you. I'll be your best cheerleader. Because when you guys move out of bondage into the freedom of Christ and God is really blessing you, nobody gets more excited than Mary and I. Nobody. I can't tell you sometimes some of the letters and emails that Mary and I have gotten as we have read and the tears have rolled down our face because we rejoice in what Jesus did in that person's life. Secondly, Growing the dynamics of faith. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. You know, one of the things that Paul was having to deal with in, in Rome is Romans were puffed up. They ruled the world. And so if you're a Roman, instantly your nose went up in the air. Okay? So much so that he had to tell them in the book of Romans, don't get puffed up because God broke off the Jews. He could break you off, graft them back in anytime he wants to. Okay? So he has to deal with this, but he, there's a secret that he reveals here. This is after he said, uh, Therefore, my brethren, uh, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. For I say... Through the grace given to me to anyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. The King James says, the measure of faith. Every one of us, when we were touched by the Holy Spirit and we got saved, there was a mustard seed of faith planted in your life. Everybody got the same seed. Being a Roman citizen gave no advantage. In fact, it may have been a disadvantage. But it's what we do with the seed. Now let's go to Mark chapter 4, verses 30 through 32, because trust in the kingdom of God and faith are almost synonymous. In verse 30, this is one of Jesus' teachings on mustard seed. So he said, And what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what shall we picture, or what shall we picture it? It is like a mustard seed, which when it is sown into the ground is smaller than all the seeds on the earth. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the herbs and shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may rest underneath its shade. I remember I saw, every once in a while you go to a Christian bookstore, you get a little keychain. That's the, the plastic, the clear plastic. And you get one with itty bitty 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 mustard seed. Now a seed, as long as it's not planted, not tended to, not cultivated, just sets as a seed. Just sets there. And part of the way that we have done church is that it's set to make, to make sure that you keep that little seed in your little plastic envelope. You can show it to everybody. Yeah, I got faith right here. See, and I, I know it's a little speck, but right there it is. I got it. It's just enough to, when I die, it says... Do pass go, do go straight to heaven, do not go to hell, okay? That's it. But we're never taught to plant it in our lives for it to grow. Because it's never meant to stay a seed. It's meant to grow so large in your life 
that it gives others shelter around you. So with that in mind, let's go to another situation where Jesus deals with mustard seed. And this is a situation when his disciples really thought they were something. I mean, they were casting out devils. They were raising the dead. They were doing all this stuff. And this guy comes to this little boy with a demon. And so they all line up. Try to cast this thing out. You know, it's almost like one of the, one of the, uh, the old westerns, you know. I'm going to get this thing. I'm going to be like a gunslinger. One tried. Oh, Peter, you always put your foot in your mouth. Get away. Let me do it, you know. None of them could do it. Absolutely none of them. And they were despondent. So much so that the guy came to Jesus and said, Listen, I have faith, but help my unbelief. Did you see what I just went through with your disciples? And so Jesus is rebuking them and teaching them. And they asked him, Why couldn't we cast it out? And so Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, If you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Be thou uh, move from here to there, and it will be moved, and nothing will be impossible to you. However, this kind does not go out except for by prayer and fasting. You know, the prayer and fa- the fasting part, he wasn't really speaking to his disciples. When you look at the controversy that arose with the disciples of John and others, they had the bridegroom with them, and Jesus said, as long as you have the bridegroom with you, you don't fast, but there's going to be a day coming when I'm taken, you're going to fast. So in, in essence, he wasn't really dealing with them there. He wasn't rebuking them for not fasting. He was planting the seed that one day they would fast. And let me tell you something, the early church fasted and prayed to see God about the need to fast and pray. Constantly. They were using the name, but somehow in their head, they had not quite developed the faith, the way, or the trust in the name and the person who originally carried the name. I can imagine what was going through their head, you know. It's just like, I'm, it's my six-shooter, bam, you're gone, you know. Don't even have to Aim. And they got into a situation that didn't work. And with the way that they were doing it and the controversy that was among them, they had lost the trust in the name. It had become more about them than the name they were carrying. That's why Jesus reminded them of the mustard seed. Listen, didn't I teach you the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed? That when you plant it, now you have not cultivated your seed to the place that it has grown up enough to shelter this boy and to get him free. Now, when I leave, there's going to be a lot of cultivating because I'm not going to be here in your face 24-7 like I am now. And so you're going to have to add prayer and fasting to it. But he did not tell a single one of them that they did not possess the ability to do it. It was an undeveloped ability because of undeveloped trust. In fact, what's amazing when you look in the Greek, there's the Greek word that's translated faith, and there's the Greek word translated doubt, and doubt is literally unfaith. It's just the opposite. So we can try trust, no trust. When doubt kicks in, it means I've entered into a place that I'm, I think I'm walking in uncharted territory and I'm not sure if God can get me through. That's why we need to cultivate it. Now, maintaining the shield of faith. This is found in Jude Chapter 2, or chapter 1. How many know Jude doesn't have chapter 2? Just see if you were paying attention. No, I'm not using one of those new translations. It has chapter 3, 4, and 5 of Jude. It's one little book. But in verses 20 and 21, he paints an interesting picture. 
But you, beloved, building yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Now we just read that, but we don't get the full expression of what it paints in the Greek. Because when he's talking about faith, we can go back to the shield of faith that's in Ephesians 6. And it goes back to the Roman soldier. How many know that his shield of faith was a large thing? It would hook together with the one next to him. They could literally build a wall. And the guy behind them could actually, they could lift up their shields and connect them together and build a canopy over them from arrows. But I always imagine that the shields were just solid steel. How many know they can get heavy? You know, not all the Roman soldiers were built like Arnold. But it was a combination of metal and woven leather. Because leather can be very, very durable, especially if it's maintained correctly. Anybody ever have, you know, I, I had a favorite lambskin jacket that I used to love to wear in the winter. And I had it, and I had it, and I had it, and I had it until the leather started falling apart. Because the leather dried out, began to crack. And see, the Roman soldier carried a pouch of oil with him wherever he would go because at night when things were peaceful, he would get out that, that oil and he would gently begin to massage that oil into the leather of the shield, making sure it remained pliable and durable so that it could take the impact of the enemy. That's the picture that Jude is painting here. That as I pray in the Spirit, and that can be interpreted two ways. Us Pentecostals want to interpret it as always just praying in tongues. It can be interpreted that way, but within the culture, setting it back historically, it can also mean praying in your native tongue to get to the place where the Holy Spirit is guiding what you're asking for. How many have prayed and prayed and prayed and all of a sudden something would rise up within you, begin praying something completely different and you know the, at that moment the Holy Spirit took over? When you do that, you spend that time soaking in prayer, you're massaging the anointing of the Holy Spirit into your faith so it stays pliable, so it can endure every fiery dart of the enemy. Now, you guys tired yet? Can I go on? Okay. Romans 10, 17. I love the, uh, some of the responses I got on our YouTube channel after I said I kicked the, the timer. It's like, kick it again, the fire's falling, you know. I thought that was hilarious. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And of course, he's referring to the preaching of the gospel. You know, in our, in our last session, I tried to deal with the balance of what we're listening to. Nobody loves a good conspiracy like Mike Lake. I will jump into Nephilim and transhugenics and AI and oh my and everything else in between, okay? But I have learned over the years that if all you do is eat of one thing and you don't have a balanced spiritual diet, especially when you're looking at intelligence like we need to look at to see what's going on so that we know what to pray against, fear will begin to rise up. Well, did you see what's happening in China? Fear, fear, fear. Have you seen what's happening in all the, the volcanoes? Fear, fear, fear. I'm thinking, I don't care what happens. I'm serving the God that can take me through. And sometimes just the road of life. The last 20 years, th th almost 30 years, Mary and I went through a hard row, and it's knocked some things out of us. God's stirring it back. You know what we're doing? We're going back and listening to words that stir faith. Going back to the old Lester Summerall videos. I'm loving the fire out of those. Jensen Franklin, a lot of ones, well, Mike, they're not Hebraic heritage. That may not be their calling, but what they're teaching, they're being probably more faithful to their calling than the Hebraic heritage people are. You see, when you have a buffet and you put out a spread, 
How many know you get all you get all disappointed if we come up here and Mary just had jars of peanut butter sitting on the table? No bread, no crackers, no chili, no nothing. Just peanut butter and spoons. Mm. What is the deal? That's what we've done spiritually. We get in these little echo chambers. I like to listen to messages of faith and messages of endurance and messages of healing along with understanding what the enemy is doing. Messages on prayer, messages on moving in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, messages on the fruit of the Spirit, all these different things. We need the full spectrum of the Word of God to be healthy. And you do it on purpose. Anybody ever just, you know, nobody's ever going to find Randy one day. He's laying in the floor of his house, and there's just empty Dorito bags all over the place. And he wakes up saying, I don't know, I just fell into them. How many know that ain't going to happen? You consume on purpose. Did you get that? You consume on purpose. What are you consuming? If faith comes by hearing, what you're hearing? I tell you what, I discovered this morning that some of the old series I used to have by Lester Sarmo where he had like 24 cassette tapes, I had to pay 70 80 $90 for them way back in the late 70s, early 80s. I can now get an MP3 for $30 a set. I got an iPhone to fill up. Listening to things that stir faith. Why is that important? Guys, not only do we need to have a balanced diet of faith, sometimes we end up in a, in a situation where we need to have a specialized diet. What's your giant? You need to start filling your life with God's Word concerning the giant that you're facing now. If it's marital problems... You start listening to men of God, women of God that teach on marriage relationships and how to avoid conflict godly and all these different things. You know I was blessed because there's sometimes you need to stir up the gifts. Paul told Timothy, stir up the gifts that were there. Sometimes you've got to stir up your faith. And I heard a story, I remember years ago, about one woman, she had been diagnosed with a terminally ill disease. She was only given six months to live. Zero hope. And she knew that there was a meeting that was coming up in about four or five months. I mean, that's kind of rough to wait for that when you have about six months left to live. That those men moved in the healing power of God, and that's what they believe for. You know what she did? She listened to healing scriptures all the time. She listened to Lester Summerall and A.E. Allen and all these guys who taught on faith. And when she wasn't watching that, you know what she did? She watched Rocky movies because she knew she had to stir up the fight within her. And one of her favorite ones was number three because she would see old Mr. T up there and said, that's my disease, go get him Rocky, go get him Rocky, hit him again. And the whole time she was building up that fighting spirit on the inside, that warring spirit on the inside. And she came into that meeting almost having more faith for divine healing than the guys were that were praying for her. It is a documented medical miracle. Now the, the doctors will say, it went into spontaneous, instantaneous remission. And we can't find a trace of it anywhere in your body. We don't know where it went. Yeah, it went straight back to hell where it belongs. But she fed her faith. And we're going to have to start feeding our faith like never before. It's time to stir things up. Now, we're in a time that heaven is getting ready to activate the warrior within. The remnant warrior. We've got to ask ourselves, what's my part to align myself with what God's doing? How do I need to change my diet? How do I need to change my attitude, my paradigms? How do I need to bring myself more in line with the kingdom? You say, Mike, you don't understand. I'm in a rut. You know what a rut is? It is a grave with the ends kicked out. 
You're supposed to be walking on solid ground, not in a rut. The devil loves ruts. He wants you to work it to where he can't even see daylight anymore because you just cut it deeper and deeper and deeper. This is the time that Jesus is handing down a ladder saying, if you'll do the work to climb out, I'll give you the power to do it. That's what we have got to do. We have got to change what we do to get different results. Well, Mike, I tried that before. You know, whenever I hear that, it's usually half-hearted. They go, it didn't work. How many know if you're in a fight for your life, it doesn't work? <laughs> you hit and you kick and you scratch and you bop and you <laughs> do everything you can to get out. That's where we're at today. The devil thought he had us all in a box where he could control us. This is the season to destroy the boxes. And to say that you're no longer going to put me in a box. My destiny is not controlled by hell. It is controlled by Jesus of Nazareth. And he is, who, he is the one who says when I live. He is the one who says when I die. He is the one who says what my missions are. You no longer control me. But Jesus of Nazareth, my king, is the only one that's going to control me. And I'm going to stay functioning in the kingdom like never before. I'm awake and I'm angry at what I allowed principalities and powers to do. And I'm not going to take it anymore, and I'm going to make sure that I'm never in that position again. I'm going to make sure that I walk with the one who when he speaks a word, the dead rises. The seas calm. The sickness leaves. Hell trembles when he speaks. That's the one that I'm going to learn to walk with and develop faith in him. And my faith is going to be greater than what they have on television. My faith is going to be greater than what they have on the evening news. My faith is going to be greater than nanotechnology. My faith is going to be greater than Nephilim returning. My faith is going to be greater than UFOs showing up. My faith is going to be greater than communists trying to take over this nation. My faith is going to be greater than the stock market my faith is going to be greater because I have learned the I have learned to trust the one who all he needs to do is to take one grain of sand and one drop of water and he balanced this planet the entire universe is being upheld by the power of his word and what he's saying right now is reach out and to take my hand the one who framed the universe is saying, come take my hand. I'll walk this out with you. Because right now we got some trust issues. But I'm the only one who has ever been found faithful. The psalmist said, there's one that will stick closer to you than a brother. Let me tell you something. There's one thing thicker than human blood, and that's the blood of Jesus. And the king is on your side. Father, I ask today that you would loose an anointing to shake us and wake us. Father, that you would loose an anointing to get us out of the rut. That you would loose an anointing, Father, that that warring spirit on the inside of us would raise up and fight. Because now is the time to fight. Now is the time to take down giants. Now is the time to turn darkness in the world. And to see the last great revival of planet earth before the sun of perdition rises. It is now. And Father, I ask that you would anoint and activate your remnant everywhere around the world. And Father, let every single one of us be counted among the remnant, we ask, in Jesus' name. The fallen immortals that rule the kingdom of darkness have enabled the esoteric societies that control this world to nearly fulfill Nimrod's dark directive. They have taken society down the Luciferian rabbit hole into a technological matrix of darkness. But the Almighty will not allow the enemy to bring his demonic forces for the final showdown without raising up one of his own. God is waking up people around the world who are shaking off their techno-sorcery-induced spiritual slumber and are answering heaven's call. There is an end-time empowerment coming for God's remnant, and it is beginning to unfold in our day. It is time to awaken be empowered and become the Sheerith in this generation. The Sheerith Imperative is a must-have tactical manual for God's remnant in the last days. 
Get your copy at KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. That's KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. Hell may have its directive, but heaven has its imperative. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the Kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.